I've had debates with men about this and they've said, well, I feel when I have more options, I can pour into my main partner more. Okay. So what he pretty much said in other words is when I externalize my feelings of self-worth, then I can be secure around you. But when that self-worth is not externalized, I can't fully show up for you because I deep down I'm insecure if I'm worthy enough. So women do respond to men in abundance. Men in abundance. Now, a lot of times men externalize their abundance. What do you which mean women respond to men in abundance? What does that mean? When men have options, mm-hmm. women respond to them better. But options aren't always externalized. Right. They're not always the money. I'm not looking at my Instagram DMs. No. Right. I don't even have Instagram on my phone. Uh, a lot of my employees take care of that. If, there, if there's important messages, they'll send me them, which is why we can get in contact. But there's no question about it that when a guy has to go, well, I'm more myself when I have options, then pretty much you've discovered that you don't know who you are. So you have a crutch. So this crutch allows you to be you. Kick the stand. Where do you go? Welcome back to the High Self Podcast. My name is Sahara Rose. And on this podcast, I love to take spiritual concepts and make them really grounded, fun, relatable in your life. So if you've been tuning into my journey for the past over a year now, I've been really diving into relationships. After my divorce in December of 2022, I was like, oh shit, there is so much I need to learn and unlearn and relearn and repattern. And it has been such a beautiful journey. And I would say now, I would say, I'm a love devotee, like the meaning of my life is love. And I would have never said that before my divorce. And I know so many people right now are going through breakups and divorces and leaving toxic situations. And they're wondering like, how can I ever love again? How can I ever trust again? How can I ever open my heart again? And it feels like this deep desire, especially as feminine beings that we have of desiring to merge with another. But we've been let down and disappointed time and time again that we're like, is this a fantasy? Is this something I have to let go of? Do I just got to like keep playing independent woman and this is my new reality? And it's tough because we can find all of the evidence that we can't trust men and we can't trust ourselves and everyone is a narcissist and everyone's out to get us. And, you know, I've been on those, those sides of Instagram too. And, and it can be a portal. And ultimately, if what we want is to love the work is to really have the tough conversations that open our heart. So you've heard me talking about it, and I wanted to bring on a real live man (laughs) to have this conversation with me to maybe access some points that I'm not seeing, you're not seeing. I mean, most of us are women here. And to speak, not just from my own heart, but really on behalf of the feminine, because I know how deeply hurt and wounded many of us have become because of deceit and betrayal and abuse and just not being fully seen and valued for who we are as feminine beings. And I just so deeply feel for the pain of the feminine, not just for myself, but like our moms and our grandmothers and all of the ancestors of women who have just wanted to love and that love not being received. So I wanted to have a conversation with someone that I found on Instagram and I really loved his video. And I'm like, let's come on and like have this dialogue on like behalf of the masculine and feminine. And like, maybe it's going to get a little saucy. We don't know where this, where this journey is going to take us, but to have some uncomfortable conversations, because I feel like this is how we can start paving that pathway towards sacred union, which is what I believe we both actually really desire. And before we get into this conversation, I would love if you would hit subscribe on this podcast. This is the best way for you to stay tuned on future episodes and it helps raise the vibration of the planet. So wherever you're listening to this podcast, hit subscribe and we'll keep the good juju flow in. So without further ado, let's welcome Naftali to the High Self Podcast. Hello, hello. Happy to be here. Welcome. The first question I'd love to ask you is what makes you your highest self? Yes, I got it planned. Okay. What makes me my highest self? Well, highest self, I feel like that may be a buzzword I won't really have an answer to. When you say it, what do you mean? Your most actualized expressed version of you. What makes me that? Yeah, whatever that means to you. Well, really, I mean speaking. Being able to spread the message, try to unify others, to collectively bring people together and just more importantly, get other people in touch with what's authentic, what's true, so that we can all be in touch with what we really are and what we actually are here to contribute because that's what makes us feel so connected to ourselves. So it's really about being connected back to our authenticity and what makes me the most connected to me is me, you know, and finding that and realizing that there's a a nice little balance between 
the error and the ideal, so to speak, the animal and the spirit and aligning them both up towards a common purpose. And then that's where you are because you aren't just you right now. There's more of you to be discovered. So a little bit of balance. Yes. Never ending. So let's start with a really light topic such as monogamy versus polyamory and open relationships. Oh, wow. How light? Let's How just light? get right in. Um, I feel like this is a really big one in the spiritual community. Mm -hmm. So I'll speak on how I feel and how most of my girlfriends feel. And this is not how all women feel. A lot of women feel that they desire to feel chosen. Mm -hmm. You know, and David Data, I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He writes a lot about polarity, but like it is this like deep feminine yearning to feel like completely chosen, that like you are more than enough. And what I feel is being propagated in like masculine media, right? Like not just the Andrew Tates of the world, but a lot, even in the spiritual world is like, if you are an alpha man, you should have a range of women to choose from. And in fact, that's going to propel you to have more of this masculinity to share. And they, you know, have this evidence that men have historically been with numerous women and that it makes sense because the men need to go out hunting and a man who is more high value would naturally have more women wanting to spread his seed. So, and, and some say that women are naturally, everyone is uh, polyamorous by nature, according to how far back you go in history. Given that we don't no longer live in tribes, and we no longer share all of our resources and, you know, have these kind of independent lives. What do you see as the model? It's, and also, yeah, like monogamy in a marriage construct is not working for most people either. So what do you see in this contemplation? Well, yeah, I just don't think, I mean, there's a, a list of things. I wouldn't just point at monogamy and say that's why marriage is falling apart. I mean, that's a whole different conversation. But there is something interesting that you mentioned, which is there is a narrative out there. And I want you to just pay attention to a little bit of the kind of man that says these things and where you really think they're sourcing this argument from. Now, if you're going to say I'm a high value man and you have this many options, so I'm going to continue about this behavior, which I have no real connection to, but I draw value from. Is he doing it because there's a level of purpose behind it? Or are they utilizing that inherently to rationalize a lot of their behavior and pull some self-worth out of it? So I kind of found it interesting. It's like multiple partners versus one-on-one. -on -one. I think that there's no question about it. If you truly want to challenge yourself, monogamy is an ideal. To, to utilize evolutionary psychology and, and say that this is the reason why my behavior is the way that it is, or if I had to bet on it, it makes you feel a certain type of way because you're insecure. I would absolutely say that's the case. And, and you know, the whole thing is they're comparing themselves to the primal man. Like, where are your 18 kids? You know, you're still stuck on one with an illegitimate mother and perhaps an illegitimate child, and you abandon that too. And you compare yourself to the patriarchal motif, to the leader, to the hunter. It's like, come on, dude, you just have an Instagram and you can't say no. So really what it is, is a protection of self-worth because so much of their self-worth is attached to that. And then of course, when they're in a committed relationship, a lot of their self-worth dissipates. So of course it doesn't work because they weren't trying to make something bigger than themselves work. It's not about purpose. It's about how they feel about themselves. And of course, it's a narcissistic rant. And look, to be, to be honest, it's like, of course, a man would much rather multiple partners just based off of like preference. But when you can actually see how much a woman can give you, if you could expand and deepen that relationship, you would never even be having this conversation. I, I completely agree with you. Do you feel that men are more wired to be polyamorous than women? Or do you think that's just based on our conditioning? Absolutely. Well, I mean, it does not work for women. And I know that if women think that it does, we can get into another conversation about that. But for men, there is no question about it. A lot of utility in having multiple partners, which is why women are hypergamous. I'm sure they throw that out and they utilize that to... Again, for narcissistic reasons, it's not, it's not for anything bigger. Like there's a function as to why women are a certain way and men are a certain way. Men do not bond the same way during sex that women do. And also there will be a limited amount of good men, which will make it a better bet for women to get pregnant by that one guy. But then again, you, you can't, remember, you can't compare those two things together. What I really noticed is that when there is a, there's a certain purpose and function behind men having to do that. It is not something they pull power from. Most men now go, oh, look at me, I'm masculine, but they're only doing these things because they pull power from it. 
they're not connected to their actions, which is the definition of what makes a man a man, is they're connected to everything that they do. They're not like, hey, look at me, I'm gonna sleep with this girl and feel a certain way. They're like, no, there's a function behind this, there's a purpose behind this, and I'm connecting to what this does for the greater good. You don't hear a lot of that. Right. Goodness. Um, people really connecting to the things that they do outside of feeling power or significance. And it's very easy to do because, you know, you would have to detach, I'm sure you're familiar with that, from a lot of what those things give you, not what they are. And I think the best way to really elaborate and explain a little bit about how monogamy isn't, it's an ideal for both men and women, but on an evolutionary case, and when there is a certain point where it actually has a function, but it's never happy and loving and pornographic. It's necessary. And it will not have negative consequences because it is necessary. And there's a big difference between the two. Yeah, like I know a lot of the polyamory like historical references are kind of like the Paleolithic era of when we didn't have homes, belongings, anything, and we were all kind of like living as nomadic tribes and you just you know, didn't know when someone was going to like come back from the war or hunting or not. So it made sense at that time. But also, I don't think we can pick and choose like, oh, I'm going to take like this aspect of the Paleolithic era, but like live my entire life in this modern lifestyle, yeah. but like just fuck a bunch of people. It's like, okay, then then go hunt. Like even back in that time, they all knew each other. There was like a sense of the men were providing for women. There was a sense of emotional connection, I'm sure, because it wasn't that big of a tribe. Whereas today to like show up, expect sex and then ghost the person is like, what is the woman really getting out of that? And I feel the yeah. women feel like a lot of women I know feel like they have to convince themselves to be okay with polyamory because of the type of men that they want are convinced that this is the more spiritual path. So they're like, I'm either going to lose him or I have to convince myself to get on board. So let me do all of the inner work. Well, it's, it's interesting, right? You ask a guy a question, are you doing this because you connect to it? Or are you doing this because it serves your interests purely? Well, all I believe all of these things, including why we have to have these conversations now is because we're all really cut off from a higher purpose. That's the reason why anybody did anything. You know, the biblical patriarchs are, are familiar, even historically had multiple partners and multiple wives. There was always a function. The function now is purely to uphold your narcissistic ideal inherently where you can pick from one thing and gather from another while not having a relationship to them. It's advanced survivalism where they can take a series of philosophies and take here and take there, abandon this, abandon that, all to serve themselves purely. And so, I mean, of course, it goes both ways though, which is, okay, women are falling, they're becoming easily seduced by this high value man thing because now you've fallen in love with a fake tiger with spray painted stripes. And then now you're like, well, this is what I want. And then of course, this is what you get because you didn't really get a spray painted tiger. Even you got yourself a French bulldog on Hollywood Boulevard, you know, and it's hard for people to tell the difference because they themselves are also connected from their values. And then now value is being distorted, which means that you can actually control and manipulate people as to what you think value comes from. And, and all of this has to do with a disconnect from your values and what you believe, because you don't really believe things if they just serve you as beliefs. It's you believe them when you're connected to the belief and it's something you do outside of outcome. And that's lost. That involves presence. That involves character. I mean, of course, and that also involves capacity. And women are really pulled to capacity. And they often misrepresent them. A man that really has something that he wants to bring into this world, and he's really connected to that, is always aware that there's going to be a level of humility involved. Because to kind of sit on your high horse is, is exactly how you don't become like a Marcus Aurelius type. Uh, somebody, uh, a, in quite literally a patriarchal type, which is one who's really there to lead, to help others, to connect to the things that they do, and also uphold the massive amount of responsibility and do it because they connect to it, not because you can see my story on Instagram. Yeah. It's like, are these men providing for all of these women that they're sleeping with? No. You know, the women are expected and, and then also be sexually available. So what would you say... I've had debates with men about this and they've said, well, I feel when I have more options, I can pour into my main partner more. Okay. So what he pretty much said in other words is when I externalize my feelings of self-worth, then I can be secure around you. But when that self-worth is not externalized, I can't fully show up for you because I deep down I'm insecure if I'm worthy enough. So women do respond to men in abundance. 
men in abundance. Now, a lot of times men externalize their abundance. What do you which mean women respond to men in abundance? What does that mean? When men have options, mm-hmm. women respond to them better. But options aren't always externalized. Right. They're not always the money. I'm not looking at my Instagram DMs. No. Right. I don't even have Instagram on my phone. Uh, a lot of my employees take care of that. If, there, if there's important messages, they'll send me them, which is why we can get in contact. But there's no question about it that when a guy has to go, well, I'm more myself when I have options, then pretty much you've discovered that you don't know who you are. So you have a crutch. So this crutch allows you to be you. Kick the stand. Where do you go? That's who you are. That's actually who you are. And then you, you, you remove the external. You have the courage to discover what it is to be in abundance internally, which means that you're no longer just existing by accident. You're existing with intention and that you are worthy. You don't need to prove that to anybody. And, and needing to prove something to somebody immediately shows that you have an insecurity, that somebody needs to see you as this A, B, and C. I don't need to have the woman to know that I'm valuable. Isn't that what everybody wants? They want to know if they're valuable. They want to know if they're enough. They want to know if they're worthy. And so ultimately that guy has a particular problem, not that he can't grow out of it and understand it, but truth be told, a man can be completely honest with the woman in front of him when he knows he has other options. It doesn't mean that he has to have other options because that's like not showing up hundred percent. And that's really where it takes courage. It's not goodbye because I got another girl that'll give me that. It's goodbye because I don't agree with what you're standing up for. And this time, you really see he's walking away because he believes in himself, not because he has another pillow to crash on. And I feel that most men leave relationships and go straight into other ones or straight into partying in other women and don't really sit with themselves alone. I've noticed this this pattern of like- Hardest thing to be. Yeah, like a lot of us women have left relationships and really sat in our solitude and sat in aloneness and done the deep healing work. And then we see our exes just like, and well, I'm like for men too, you know, they, they do the worst thing. They open up their Instagram. Right. And, and it's like, and it's not going to prevent you from feeling, it's just going to decay. Like it's going to make it just come later on. So what do you say when a man in response to this says, well, I believe that love is an unlimited resource and I have unlimited love to share. So why should I only share love with one person? You know, I've heard that from women too. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's a very uh, free love 1960s. Exactly. I think it comes from a lack of understanding of how humanity works. There's godliness in you. There's godliness in me. We exist with limitations, with unlimited potential. It's hard to juggle. But when we understand that our job isn't to give love to everybody, it's to give love to those who are in front of us. That is a very difficult understanding because how can that be easy? We have this feeling of eternity inside of us, especially when you connect to it. And, you know, that's why like the polyamorous cult king kind of there's a lot of pull to him. And and there's a reason why there's a lot of pull is because he is in touch with that infinite spirit. Now, here's what you want to know. It's actually kind of interesting because a lot of people, a lot of men particularly will find that and then they'll exploit it because now they're getting power from it, which means they're no longer connected to their actions, which was to give love. And yeah, you know, to be honest, you could go ahead and heal a series of people until you realize why are you doing it? It had function then. It's, it's losing its function now. And why do you need to be sleeping with people to help them? <laughs> do you know, do you know, it's really interesting. This is, this is something in my life personally that I've actually had very recently, which is you will actually start to get negative consequences. You will start to feel negative emotion after sex if you have not integrated your sexuality. There's a certain hierarchy to it. Do you know the lowest level you got porn because you're hiding and you're masturbating. Second level, just good old masturbation, use your mind at least, you know, get creative. Then after that is shared masturbation. So that's inherently transactional sexual interactions where you're not hiding. After that, you have healing, healing and intimacy. That's a particular place where if you can heal, then you can build. Because then when you're building, you're also healing and you're also sharing. So building is the highest level that you can be at in terms of just like building yourself up sexually to be in a place where you can actually contribute, you know, where you're not just taking, where you're also not just letting your insecurities define how you feel in a relationship. Men and women deeply challenge each other. And, and that's really what keeps us so drawn to one another is we're, we're aware that we are one whole coming together and it's not over yet. I got to pull it out of you and you got to pull it out of me. And when there's insecurities there, there's no longer a, I'm, I'm on your team. It's why are you trying to bring me down? And then of course there's a break because you're not, we're not being taught how to be in relationships. We're, we're being disconnected from what we're trying to even do in relationships to protect and provide, to be connected to that, you know, to understand what that means in every level. And, you know, for women, it's inherently to, to care, love and heal and to support. 
There's no connection with that. You're not going to hear that in school. You're not going to hear that in Western culture. And I mean, third world countries, you've got third world problems. So that's a whole different, different conversation. And what I really noticed is, is just that if people can actually come to what exactly this is, like what it really means, it is to connect. As crazy as that sounds, that's actually where you want this to go. You don't want sex to be the need for power. Because when I detached from that, it was awful. And I know that's a crazy, and by the way, and then you keep doing it because you don't know any better. Well, then you start to lose sex. Your nervous system starts to become affected. You just start to look towards something aimlessly. And then of course you have nothing to offer because you're lost. So it's truly for connection. Because you're listening to this podcast, I'm going to make a quick assumption about you. Your friends come to you for advice. Whenever you're at a party, someone corners you at the side of the snack table and starts telling you all of their childhood dramas. <laughs> and you actually love diving deep into spiritual topics and you have a really good way of communicating with people. So the best way to actually create a career doing this is through coaching. But I know a lot of people, they're like, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what type of coach I would be. So I've created a quick, easy quiz to discover your unique coaching style. So there are three categories, the intuitive, transformational, or empathetic coach. So the intuitive one really works with your intuition. You're able to receive downloads. You just have insights about people. The transformational one has more of that fire energy. You love to keep it real and help people go through the deepest Phoenix rising from the ashes moments in their lives. And the empathetic coach really loves to listen, hold space. They're very grounded, nurturing. So if you're curious which type you are, you can try my free quiz at quiz.highestselfinstitute.com. Again, that's quiz.highestselfinstitute.com, which is my school that certifies spiritual life coaches. And you can find that link in the show notes. I'm super excited to see what type of coach you are because I'm going to hire you one day. So trust your intuition, trust your inner wisdom, trust your inner guidance. Plus plus and I feel that a lot of men are using porn as a crutch to not actually have deeper connection. I, I feel that there is an agenda with the amount of porn being like, it's like 80% of the internet is porn. Like it's yeah no it, it's crazy. it's frightening it's frightening everything yeah. turns to porn like no, AI aver will change average the world age porn. is eleven years old for boys starting to watch it it's like the average eleven year old boy has seen more naked women than like the kings of ancient yeah and it's ridiculous <laughs> and, and you know you experience them through a screen yeah and they're not actual women it's like it's 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 all fake and it's, it's for the male gaze and it's performative it's not actually what women would even enjoy in bed. So I see collectively that a lot of men are like, well, I'm just going to watch porn because I don't want to deal with a fucking woman. You know, she's got emotions. I have to like call her. I have to this. I'm going to watch my porn, jack off, not deal. And then so a lot of women are like, I don't feel pursued. I don't feel, I don't feel chased. So I don't, I don't feel this receptive energy that I need for my turn on. Mm. So then they're either lowering their standards because they just need intimacy. And that's, I think, this rise of the situationship, Right. Or they're just on their own. And I just feel, and then the men are getting more angry because they're not, oh, yeah. you know, they're not getting the sex. And I think mm -hmm. we're the first generation to have less sex than the generation predestining us. So let's talk about porn and specifically like how it's really fucking with people's brains. Well, do you know, it's actually really scary when you realize this, that most people don't know that. They don't know that it's fucking with their brains. They assume that it's harmful. Well, you have a culture that pretty much promotes as much distance as possible between men and women in the name of autonomy. Like as if we both don't represent 50% of the cosmos collectively, 100% together. So there's an absurdity behind that, right? Well, first off, what's the worst thing you can do to a man? Well, give him convenient anything, anything convenient. And it's something interesting is that women are more internally curious about themselves. You know, they're not going to be looking under a table or looking under a skirt, but you look at young boys and they're already out there to look. You know, they will put themselves in a position to go, oh, what happens if I look under the skirt? Or what happens if I reach for these boobs? Like, like curious curiosity in men is always externalized. And for women, it's internalized. Mm -hmm. So inherently, you have a bunch of young little boys who are being put on a platform to connect with others because that's the avenue by which people connect with now, which is inherently, oh, did you see Sneeko's new video? Or did you see Andrew Tate? Or things that people want to talk about. So you inherently have to be part of the virtual medium. And then with the virtual medium, well, you got TikTok, you got Instagram, and ah, Facebook doesn't really exist anymore. But anyways, you got those two. And they're funnels to Pornhub. 
especially for a young kid, the most fascinating thing is going to be sex because that's completely correlated towards why you're so curious. You're curious so you can start building. You're curious so you can start finding yourself. And so you exploit all of that curiosity into sexual voyeurism. So you're pretty much experiencing the whole list of the emperors of old who had an extraordinary amount of capacity, an extraordinary amount of responsibility, which is fair enough. Okay, enjoy your multitude of women, but at least you're doing something. So instead, you give a man a plaque that's in their pocket that they can go ahead and look at at any moment, and they could experience not only the most powerful dopamine hit of their life, an expansion of their sexual nature without any understanding of what that's going to mean for them in their adulthood. Majority of my life was actually integrating how much damage that's done to me, because if you want to feel shame, take a computer into a bathroom and share your sex with a screen, because in other words, you're hiding your sexuality. Anything that you hide is going to fuel shame. And of course, and what do you think happens? You go out in the world, you see women, you don't na- feel the natural inclination, which is interact. You feel freeze up. Yeah. And often that could even, ha- and especially around beautiful women, and it will create a lot of entitlement, yes, and a lot of anger, because they'll create a split. They'll have the women under them that they're, they don't care about at all, but then the women over them who are like goddesses, and they're powerless. So they often mistreat a number of people under them, but pedestalize these women over them, which creates, I mean, of course, serious dissatisfaction for women because what makes women extraordinarily happy is strong men and seeing that they're safe because then it leaves room for expansion and the next generation. And they could fuel that love through their children, through their husband, through the creative work that they're accumulatively sharing together. It's no longer this nightmare, but it's not something people talk about in schools. You get sex ed with a fucking banana. Like, what is that shit? You know, and everybody has a goddamn porn device because if you think a 12-year-old is utilizing that for anything else and you're an absolute idiot. And how that cosmically affects men and women, you know, and of course, and you do it by making men weak because that by byproduct makes women masculinize. You know, porn is just one of the avenues by which they're making men weak and there's a series of others. But when men could really start understanding if they could already start doing one thing to improve their life, Get off the hub. And if you're not using social media to genuinely bring something or contribute with it, delete it. I don't care. If you're not watching this, then you're probably better off. Because then you're not part of a system that is designed to exploit you so that you can become weak, making men more feminine, women more masculine, and disconnecting us from what really allows us to fight back. Because that's what we do. We do that within the context of a family. Power is in numbers, in belief, in, in community. You'd conquer nation just by over-reproducing, you know? And then look how, you know, capitalism and our Western society benefits from that. If men are not in their power, well, they're going to be docile and they're going to accept, you know, whatever laws are passed. Mm-hmm. And if women are, as a result, have to be in their masculine, well, you've got more income coming in. The GDP of the countries go higher. You know, the whole like feminist movement. That's wild that you know that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, if you can get them both doing the same thing. Exactly. So like that whole, we can do it to 1950s, that housewife, that like iconic poster. Mm-hmm. When, no, it was, it was before that. It was, it was like the around world. Or is that exactly. baking it was like, soda? No, it was like around World War I or World War II. I think World War II probably. And it was like, women can do what a man can do mm-hmm. because the men were out in war. War. So I, I believe it was actually funded by the Rockefellers, this, the, that big movement of, well, if the men are out in war, who's going to be working all the jobs? So let's tell women, you can do exactly what a man can do. You can drive trailers, you can this, you can that. And, and, and a woman can, but is that how we're designed? Is that our optimal desire? Ask most women truthfully, and it's a no. Absolutely. But now it's actually starting to turn into a yes, because there's attached value to it, that women can pull more value from it. And actually what you're talking about is foreign to most women. It's foreign. So in fact, what you're doing is pulling the rug by which they stand on. How do you think that's going to go? Well, here's why I un- I understand, like, it is important for women to have access to our own resources because it allows us to walk away from, situ- like, toxic situations, abusive marriages, like, so many things women are— You're describing are- choice. Right, exactly. So when you don't have access to resources, which is, like, most of the Middle East, many parts of the world still, you have to stay in these shitty situations. Not just there, you go to Beverly Hills and many women are still in those relationships because of the money. Mm -hmm. So it's important for women to have access to it, but is it through doing the exact job that a man does? 
I don't want to use the word should, but I believe our optimal capacity is, is sharing our feminine nature, Absolutely. you know, like having conversation, using our natural nurture abilities, our abilities to connect, our abilities to create art and beauty in this world. But those things aren't valued by our society. They're not paid by our society, you know? Yeah. Well, your society doesn't really care about anything bigger than what you can contribute to it. Exactly. It's not, it's not focused on the development of humanity because like, if you actually look at how society is catered, it does not give a shit about how you feel. It doesn't consider anything bigger than what you can contribute to some sort of monetary value. And that's going to define you in, in, in school, growing up, the test you have, or the title that you have along with the income that you make. And, and if you get people chasing that, then you get people not connecting to where real value comes from. Yep. Because if it, it is a difficult thing to experience our humanity, because through our humanity comes an evolution of beauty that we can contribute. It's not just about trying to survive anymore. We're not there. And you know, you, you spoke about this earlier, which is like, I live for love. This is the generation where real love can be made. Hmm. It's not what it looks like. It's more than what you can imagine. And it's made because now we have an opportunity to choose. We can deep, deep, we, we can find our soulmate now. And like, you know, like that, that's a luxury. But yeah, you're also gonna have to deal with a list of narcissistic psychopaths, um, um, inflated egos, porn addiction, drug addictions the need to exploit yourself for some sort of value. It's going to get a little dark, but if you got a good set of values and a, an integrated individual, then you're on the highway to finding something that we're here to do. You just need to do it one day to experience it once and it's worth it. I agree. And I, I hold that same faith. I feel as a woman, this, and this is maybe, I want to hear your perspective on this. I, I listen to like men's relationship stuff. I'm like, I'm just curious, what's the advice men are giving to other men? And it's a lot of men complaining about how masculine women have become. And they're saying like, I'm not attracted to her because she's in her masculine. I don't even know, like she criticizes everything that I do. She's not receptive to me when I come home. And, and I understand that. And I don't think a woman wants to be that way, but it's almost like when let, let's say you have been, you're a dog and you, this dog has been abused so many times. You're not going to like come home to your owner. Like, hi, how are you? It's like, I think that's where women collectively have gotten of just like, I've been so let down so many times. So I'm just going to like take care of myself and like hope for nothing from you because I don't want to have an expectation and that expectation not be met again. So I feel like women have had to create these shells around our hearts because our hearts just can't keep breaking again and again and again. And then, Absolutely. And then men are like, well, I, I, can't, I can't love you because of that. So where do we lean in? It's rough. I mean, men get heartbroken too, you know? So there's no, there's no um, it, it's not better for one or the other, but I definitely noticed that women have a harder time integrating it because it requires complete and total, like, you know, you freeze, a wa you freeze some water and then you break it down into liquid form again. It's going to need a vessel or else it's going to evaporate. So, and it's an entirely new wa water on the other side. Yeah. And that's the whole thing is it does change the quality of it. And it doesn't mean that it loses its value because it's still water, but it will change the overall purity. Now, there is something very interesting about it is that a lot of men do have an expectation now because we are in a different world. And I feel like that because we were put in this quote, different world, we abandoned responsibility and what it means to actually show up for your partner, because that's going to happen, period. I don't care if your wife's the most feminine woman in the whole world and you're the most masculine machismo man on planet earth and you guys, the polarity is like the cosmos, the sun and the moon. You're going to have that happen in your relationship. And, and it's really important that men do understand that, right? Which is you got to be able to provide stability to this. Now, also, if you have an expectation from somebody that's clearly not changing their behavior, you're going to have to do the most difficult yet most appropriate thing possible. Walk away. Because what's actually crazy is that it will start to bring a lot out in the man that needs to be confronted. Now, what you're describing is probably a lot of people that have no relationship with their values and have an expectation from somebody. Now, if you're going to be around women and you're going to idealize them, then you're probably going to be complaining. Because if you think that women just exist, no, we exist accumulatively together towards a common purpose, one in support of the other towards that common purpose. And if you're not in touch with that, what do you, you're just placing an expectation that somebody needs to behave so that you can conveniently go about your life as that person doesn't bother you. You know, I'll give you a worst case scenario, even worse than coming home to an aggressive woman. Imagine coming home to an agreeable one who continuously pents up more and more resentment and with a smile off. on her face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a smile on her face. Okay, baby. Yeah, and she'll cut your dick off in the middle of the night where she'll absolutely blow up and then she'll do something and then you'll go, oh my God, what's wrong with women? What was I not paying attention to? 
And that all comes from men not understanding that we need to have the ability to provide stability for ourselves first. Because when you can do that, of course, you can provide stability for her. And guess what? It's rewarding for a man to do so. It's not just about meeting the love of your life. It's about actually finding the parts of yourself that you wish to conquer and being able to share that with somebody. Then there's love for a man there. And women by, by, by default are already dealing with a lot of the chaos that creates a lot of the beauty that you see in the world nowadays. It comes from women. So the entitlement issue typically comes from men with a poor understanding of what women are. I don't care feminine, third world, pick them up, ship them out, Ukraine, whatever it is. Women are going to be tough and you're just going to have to accept that because that's going to come with life. Now, of course, if, if this is coming through avenues by which are ruining your life, like perhaps a narrative that's poisoning a relationship, and maybe she picked up on that narrative. And I was like, well, that's the Adam and Eve story right there, right? There's a, there's a snake that tells you there's more. And then now, that, now that might make you more critical of your partner, but your partner absolutely has to understand that that story is true about men. You have to be aware that a strong man, the outside world can't touch him. When he's got tribe, when he's got community, when he's got abundance, can't touch him. But if you poison the woman, you'll watch that man crumble to the ground like dust give you a concept of how powerful women are. And men need to be aware of these things. They need to really believe in what they say because they're just throwing out like, what I believe is true. Mm, that's not gonna work. What you believe is true is you sit there and she continues doing the same thing that has been absolutely making you deteriorate as a man. Do you believe it? Really? It's a difficult thing for a lot of people to go through, but there might need to be a divorce. I'm sure you experienced that so that maybe you can start doing it right. You know, don't attach to the value of that, you know, the expectation that your family has on you. You're the fuck up. No, do the most loving thing that you can possible. Walk out, but know why you did. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. So one of the relationships I'm the proudest of in my life is the relationship I have with my mom. So she was like my bestie, but slash like kind of frenemy sometimes. She would tell me what to do and it would trigger me so badly. It would like get under my skin. I couldn't take it. And I would just react like my inner teenager when she would say something. Like it almost felt like I wasn't allowed to do it. So it's through therapy that I really dove into it. And I saw it was my hurt wounded inner teenager that I no longer am as a 33 year old woman. So by going into it and speaking with my inner teenager and realizing that now I'm free and also my mom is just saying these things because she loves me and wants to protect me and I don't have to listen. It really helped me get a lot of liberation on the other side and actually make us closer than ever. In fact, she's coming to stay with me tomorrow. So this is just one of the many benefits of therapy. And if you're interested in giving it a try, I highly recommend trying better help. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time with no additional charge. So get those relationships where you can fully feel seen, met, heard, respected, and understood by visiting betterhelp.com slash Sahara to get 10% off your first month of therapy. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Sahara. You can find that link in the show notes. So trust your intuition, trust your inner wisdom, trust your inner guidance, close your eyes and listen. How can women who are in relationships right now where they don't feel valued for, you know, the inherent, inherent beauty and feminine that they bring, what can they do to like speak this to a man? Well, you can always be sweet and you don't need to make it personal. An open conversation is a difficult conversation to have because it may make you see the person differently, but that's exactly how vulnerability works is that the alternative, remember, is resentment, infidelity, domestic abuse, porn, hiding, cheating, lying, stealing, hurting, some cases killing. So we definitely do have a very dark side and that we have to have these open conversations because those open conversations can allow you to realize that some things in this relationship need to be improved. Do you because isn't that like the point, you know, men, have an open space? Do you feel like I've found, and a lot of my friends, the men don't change until the women walk away. And then by that point, it's often like too late. Well, that, that's not a man changing. Right. It's that, him, that's but sometimes chasing. it's like he doesn't realize what he has until it's gone and no amount of explaining yourself gets through to him. I mean, that is the case, you know, like there's a certain point where, yeah, you, you do have to walk away. And I've, I've realized this even in my family where um, some of the relationships are really rocky. 
people pleasing in men and people pleasing tendencies in women create a lot of destruction. So there is a certain point where when you do walk, and even for women, you walk and now they want you, right? When I'm one step out the door, you want it. Now you have to start rewarding this in people. If we can sit down, have the conversation and come to the conclusion to a better future, then we're doing something right. But if it demands me mistreating you, walking away, or packing my bags for you to go, babe, wait, then clearly negative attention gets you to respond more positively than when I sit down and give you attention, which means that that person has to confront a lot of the internal wounds that they have, which is inherently being mistreated, draw somebody closer together, which you will get a lot of, you know, and there's no question about it. It's like, you can do that. But remember, that's the kind of person you're going to have to mistreat. And eventually you'll forget what love is. Because the more that you do this to other people, you're actually going to start attracting that to yourself. And then you'll start responding to bad behavior and you'll start chasing. And then she's like, I'm going to go out and drink with my friends. I want you to stay home. It's a girl's night, whatever it is. And then you're like, well, that's behavior I don't like, but now it's making a chase. So what's she getting? She's getting more of you. The more she sits, she shits on you and vice versa. So it is a really dangerous thing is that people need to understand that if she now says all the things that you wanted her to say, when you walked in there and you said, Hey babe, we need to have a conversation. When you're 10 feet out of the house, then guess what? It doesn't count. And you have to get people to own up to that which is it takes courage to be open with the person in front of you. If you need to see everything in your life walk away from you, then you don't really have a relationship with those things until you lose them, which means you're a child. You got some growing up to do. Oh, I'm into that one. <laughs> but yeah, I see for a lot of friends of mine who are in situations where, you know, I see a lot of, of women with men with addictions of various sorts. And it's often when she's packing the bags, taking the kids, walking away that he's like, okay, I'll go get help. And then she stays and then he gets help for a little bit and then it goes back and it yeah, goes it's back. Yeah, it's a tactic. It's a manipulation tactic. Yeah. You can peak the emotions and then you could say everything right before they make the decision and then go back on that decision. And what you could do is you could pull somebody between decisions, which makes them very weak. And you pull them in this space in between until they're nothing. You could blow them over like air. They'll start hallucinating on the kitchen floor going, what the hell's happening to me? It's more common because, you know, a, a lot of the time people don't want to work on these things because their worth is associated to it. When really, a lot of men don't know this, but women are so damn receptive to men that want to be better, especially when they don't tie, when they don't tie it to their self-worth. You know, like, you're right. You know, this is something that's um, eliminating my ability to be the best husband, to be the best partner, to be the best father, to be the best friend, to be the best son, to be the best brother. And this has been something I've been running away from. And, you know, what's the one thing that all men want to hear from women? I'm on your side. Don't yell, don't be harsh, don't be critical, be feminine and utilize that influence because you'll watch when you don't make him do something, you have to do this. You influence him to do it. They'll be far more open to do it. But of course you have to set your boundaries too, which is you need to know where is your breaking point. Is it a month? Is it a week? Is it today? Is it right now? And by the way, the more I care about yourself, it's going to be the next five minutes because the quality of your life is deserving of that. So not only do you develop a tighter relationship with life, you develop a higher standard for your relationships. And by the way, what does that show her? What does that show him? That you really care about yourself. You care about your time. You know how much it's worth. Because it's not just about loving him. It's about loving the people around you. Your brothers, your sisters, your nieces, your nephews, your uncles, your aunts, your mom, your dad, your friends. Give to that and then watch how much you're worth. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. And it's hard because... I see a lot of women are like, okay, I'm going to walk away. But then it's this fear of like, will I ever find someone? I can't do this online dating That's thing. beautiful. Do you know, you know, when so will I ever find somebody? Mm -hmm. Substitute those words of, am I enough? Mm -hmm. Am I worthy? We externalize those things. And, and particularly men, which is why men entitled, which, which you'll see a lot of angry men. It's like, well, it's typically what happens when they're disappointed, they get angry. Because that means their expectations weren't met because they didn't communicate what they actually wanted and needed from you and also from themselves. So, oh no, if I walk away from this, don't externalize it. Ask yourself the real question. Am I worthy of something better? Am I enough? And then immediately the boyfriend disappears or whatever you had attached to the certain outcome or feeling or emotion disappears. And you ask yourself the real fundamental questions which allow you to start contributing because you're actually contributing something from a place of value and a, a place of authenticity. Yeah, I find that the law of attraction is completely like accurate when it comes to love of like whatever your, 
your underlying beliefs are, are reflected back. And when you have the belief of, I will never find someone that will be a reality. And then when you have that belief of all men are this or that, you just find those people, you know, it's like, look for the red car. You start seeing the red cars. So I feel a lot of women feel, and myself, and I see this, that women are putting a lot of work in themselves. You know, there's this collective divine feminine goddess movement. Women are really having difficult conversations, looking at their childhood. I don't see the same. It's happening, but not as big with men. So I do feel there's a numbers difference around conscious women versus men, like even just statistically. Here's something interesting. Men are doing it and women are doing it too. It just doesn't look like an elevation of male nature. So it may look more destructive. It may look more performative, but they're looking to create better results in their life, just like women are. And I mean, this goes for both sides. There's going to be a collective amount of mentors, teachers, coaches, therapists, and counselors who are going to be good. And then there's going to be the same collective that suck. So it's really just about finding inherently, like not just the people that are right for you, but the people who are really trying to sell, tell you the truth. And I think there's like a really good common denominator behind that, which is, yeah, women are typically pulled towards growth and development. Well, because what do you think you do? You help develop and grow the things around you. You flourish it, you amplify it. So I just think that's more personality type for women, that they're more prone to go ahead and learn about these things that inherently could develop their capacity to contribute. And so are men, but men are a little more protective of their worth at the moment. So they're going to find places that immediately allow them to get an immediate gratification, which is going to make them weaker in the long run. But we definitely are both. And I mean, there's a collective amount of like what you call female gurus that are actually spreading really bad information for women too. And the same thing goes collectively for men. But I do believe that we are collectively working really hard on doing that. But dude, victimhood for men is catharsis because there's community around victimhood and, and it's really bad. And, you know, there's also community around trauma for women. You know, they just start bonding with each other and they're like, oh my God, I don't need a man. Single motherhood is better. I'm a boss bitch. And then all of those things are protective. It happens in both groups. And if you're seeing it happening for women, men are doing the same thing. I believe that there's a point right now where we're going to actually hit like a really big breakthrough for both. When men can start connecting to the things that they do and they actually start fighting back. It's a lot of fight that men don't have anymore. And it's like, well, you could start inside. It'll manifest externally because you can know you could do it internally. It's a great place to start. And then I'll make women feel a lot safer. And they'll also respond to a lot more men because they're not doing it for pussy anymore. Like that's the real reason why most people join courses. And they're just not even being honest with it. It's not just for the money. It's for what the money can give them. Some sort of power, significance. They could attach that to women. But it is, it is definitely something I did notice. But women won't like the answer. If they're really looking for the truth... They will not like the answer. It's going to require the most difficult thing for a woman. And it's like, well, to connect back to your femininity and your femininity is so damn vulnerable. It's not an easy place to be in. And then you look around and your scarcity kicks in. What do you see? A bunch of pussies, world-class ones, angry too, very likely to hurt you, manipulate you. And then you're like, well, why should I do that? It's like, there's only one reason to do this. And even as a man right now, you can get so much being a tactical, narcissistic motherfucker. But my God, you have to start connecting to the things that you believe in if you really want to start seeing a shift. You know, men need to connect to their roles and women need to connect to theirs with an expectation that they're not placing on the opposite sex. Men do it too. I'll start being this man when I get this woman. They do that all the time. And women do it too. I'll start being feminine when I meet the man. Good fucking luck. Because it takes work now so that you feel worthy of it when you're there. You want to experience it. Because when you're at that table with all the people that you love around you, you knew that you did it for yourself. And that means that the love that you give him is enough, which means you won't be insecure in it and vice versa. He's like, well, I found, I, I was able to rule the kingdom without the queen and I connected to it. And then the queen comes. Well, for the woman, I was, I was able to provide for the kingdom before the king came and then the king comes because now you're accepting. It's not if, it's just when, but what about now? What is this bringing out for me? That's gone. That notion where you, you could pay attention to you and that there's something happening for you. There's something bigger collectively. It's not about your paycheck. It's not about the status. It's not about the followers. It's not about the, the virtual or, orgy. It's, it's really just about you. 
Can you find your love for you first? Because believe me, you'll never have a damn imposter again when you do. It's in that desert, the night sky and the cool wind. As you know, you're walking towards somewhere where there's going to be family, there's going to be unity. But then you found yourself there with nothing around. You know, it's the Psalm by David, you know, although I I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for God is with me. There's something about that. It's there you find God. Because if God is there, then no shit he's going to be in the room with everybody that you have around you in your whole life. And when you know that and you believe it, your partner is really just a manifestation of literally everything you could ever imagine. All because you did it for you. Because that's what it's about. It's about discovering ourselves. And this is the process by which we do it. And that is when you find love. And that is when you have children. And that is when you evolve. And that is when you learn from your children. And when you realize that they're better than you. And that's, that's a happy father. That's a happy mother. That's a happy life. You know, to realize that what we put back is better than ourselves. That means we did a good job. Yeah. I love what you, what you shared about doing it for yourself, because when you do these things for yourself, it can't be taken away from you. Oh, yeah, just and, please, right? <laughs> and I feel a lot of times with breakups and divorces, it feels like love was taken from me that I was like in this beautiful, like my mother's womb of love where I'm connected with the cosmos and all things. And now it was like stripped from me. And then it's like, how do I find myself back in love? I like that. You, you know, know there, there's something really beautiful about that. Yeah. Within the mother, you are whole. Yes. And then you come out detached, right? And then you connect again to that love. And it's like a forever process. And then that mirrors again with your children. You feel so whole and complete with them. And then if you want to be the overbearing mother attached to the children, right? But now you're at a point where you're you're really realizing that life is about this feeling of coming in, connecting, and letting go. You know, but the part of the letting go process is you're going to realize that you're a human being and you will attach. That's where the character comes in, right? Where you're like, oh, my son, I love him so much. And he grows up. And you and now you keep trying to do everything for him. Oh, shoot, my claws are in. Why are my claws in? What about this doesn't believe in my son? What about this doesn't believe in what I've done for him up to this point? Let go of the claws then you let go and then it comes back. It's really powerful, powerful stuff here because through that process is where you're developing wisdom. Exactly. And knowing ourselves as the embodiment of love, because when you live as love and you, you know, I love how in the collective, they talk about romanticizing your life. And I actually believe that this is so important of, you got to romanticize you know, it. Yeah. yeah. Like get yourself the flowers, do take yourself on the dinner, do those things for yourself, because then you're creating the life that you think you can only have in relationship. And that's upping your self-worth because then you're not like dependent on someone else to bring me those things. You're like, I'm already living at this set point of love. So then sharing it with someone else is just going to amplify it. Yeah, it'll elevate your game. Lose it if it's not there. And I see a lot of women prematurely enter into relationships where they don't fully know the person. They might overlook the red flags because they just want to be in love. That it doesn't even matter really who it is. Exactly. Yeah, you think I just need to be in love is is not a product of love. That sounds more like you're, you're desperate looking for an out because you feel completely internally void. Well, I think most people, men and women, feel inherently lonely because our society has made us inherently lonely and your partner has become what the entire village used to be. It's your best friend, your oh, confidant, yeah, you're this, you're oh, that, you're that. So when yeah. you don't have it, it's like, I, don't, I lost my whole village. You know, most people don't even have like friends in our that, society. You know, that that's actually really heartbreaking. Yeah, most people don't have friends. Like, they don't have people that'll tell them the truth. They have people that'll get drinks with them on the weekend and then go, bro, um, I actually wanted to tell you, but that relationship you were in was absolute shit for you. Good thing you're out of it now. Right. And you're like, they didn't speak a thing. Yeah. Didn't say a fucking word. <laughs> yeah. I got married to the damn woman, right? You know, like again, it's it's You were my best man. No. <laughs> yeah, you were you were my best man. That speech you said, you yeah. know. I don't know, dude. It's performative, it's avoidant. It's uh But I feel that mm-hmm. marriage for so long has been role playing. I'm going to play the role of the wife and these are my duties and you're going to play the role of the husband. And love, it was actually a very new concept to be brought into marriage. Like if you've ever, you know, read the book, um, Conscious Uncoupling, they like talk about like where like actual marriage came to be. So I feel a lot of us right now, we don't even know what the roles are that we're looking for. And it's making us more confused because, you know. They're there. Yeah. Like but it's confusing now because it's not that I need a man to pay my bills and I need a woman to take care of my house. We can individually do those things, but there's something that I think we deeply feel is missing. But I feel our society makes us feel wrong for also naming that mm-hmm. of like, if you if you're not, like people say, you got to just love being single and keep loving yourself and self-love and self-love. And I get that. And you need the self-love. No, yeah, so it's you, like, should, you should get married and start a family. You, know, like <laughs> you should really well, connect a, to that. You right. Know? But it's a balance of 
the shadow of just going into the marriage and the family because you feel like you can't oh, be that, alone. That's, again, that's that, yeah. that's beautiful that you can recognize yes. that. Yes. There's, there's, there's an opportunity now. The right. roles are there. They work. They evolved, which means that they also stayed the same because well, nothing think, really changes. And I changes. think they're, they're different in each relationship too. There's, there's more for us to discover in ourselves, to meet back at the common core values that were always the thing that brought us together. But there's more to be discovered in ourselves. So that right now what we're experiencing is, is that there's a much larger individuation process, a process by which people are coming to their own values and what they believe. You know, you take the religious girl, but as their parents tell her all the time, well, get married, right? Well, now get married. It becomes an expectation from people that you love and maybe you don't even connect to it. So, you know, you're always told, well, sex before marriage. Compound those two beliefs with each other. You'll get yourself a really repressed, awful marriage in a world that is evolving. So right now we are actually given the opportunity to realize that these things are good. They are the ideal. They are. But you got to integrate yourself into it because you're the thing that brings it into this world. And if you're not connected to it, then you will destroy your marriage. You will literally burn your road to love because then you will, you, you will tell yourself, well, I've given everything that I can to this. Well, did you really? It's like, well, no, you think you did. Now you sabotaged your ability to actually do it. If you want a beautiful, loving relationship, you're going to have to integrate your sexuality. There can't be a drop of shame behind it. You're going to have to be willing to be a monkey with that person as much as you'll be an angel. You also got to connect with each other on those core values, the things that you want to cumulatively build together, not because your parents told you or the institution told you, or because, I don't know, maybe somewhere around you just said, why not? We have an opportunity to choose these things. And believe me, when you choose these things, we create an evolution of it because there's, there's two archetypes you have right now. The burdened mother in the marriage that doesn't satisfy her with her children, which by the way, brings women fulfillment existentially. It's already been proven. You don't need to ask me that. Even marriage does too. But they look exhausted, burnt out, unfulfilled, disconnected from their creativity. By the way, it's a really heartbreaking thing to see in women. And it makes a lot of men go, ooh, you know, this motherhood thing seems to be like, kind of kills them, snips them at the butt. And then you see this woman that's uh, connected with her individuality, doing her things, expressing herself sexually open and expressive and owns it. And men are like, wow, but then there's no family and children, right? So we're kind of left with these, these archetypes are broken. We need to collectively integrate both of those. Now, what I realized is, is that when the woman that's connected to her individuality can integrate herself towards those, towards the ideal, what ends up happening is, is you create somebody that is extraordinarily beautiful and is going to thrive in every aspect of their life because they won't be forsaking the fulfillment and the purpose and meaning that comes behind those things. They'll be connected to it. You know, a lot of men aren't connected to fatherhood. They aren't connected to what it is to be a husband right? And so what do you think happens? It's a portion of hair transplant by 40 and fucking the secretary. What do you think that's a manifestation of? A non-integrated shadow, a lot of repressed emotions, a feeling of expectation burdened by life. You're burdened by the thing that makes us literally fulfilled. That means you didn't do it right. You didn't bring yourself into the picture. And that, and that takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of self-discovery. And I think even more importantly, it takes a really good relationship with your animal nature. I'm aware I'd run away with the secretary if my wife's exhausted and, and now she's no longer connected to raising the children and she's becoming more, ma more masculine. You don't, th I, that's why I want to have the tough conversation with that person, really asking them and challenging them and flicking them as they flick me going, do you actually believe these things or are you just doing this because there's nothing fucking else for you to do? Right. And it's like a very big, big fine line. But when you could integrate the ideal into all of your individual passions, it's like it unlocks you. And you're no longer exhausted. And what do people see? They see something that's archetypal. They see something in the image of God. That's the definition of the archetype. It's like the ideal image, right? Something bigger. And we could do that, but we have to consider ourselves. So I'm curious to question, why is marriage and children the ideal? Like those are two things I don't desire. Okay, wonderful. I think that's great that you can be so honest with yourself. Well, having gone through a marriage and that being you see, the that, thing. That's a really good thing for you to say to somebody any anytime at any point. But you, like, that's also the thing about dating is that you're also going to have to be ready for why. Well, for me, I grew up thinking about my wedding day because I've been conditioned that way. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. being, Persian, being Persian, it's like yeah. who you marry is the most important thing. Like even the songs that like pop songs are like, oh, you, you, we have this term, you've become a pickle, which means you're like above 30 and not married. So you've pickled and it's like, you make fun of them. And it was always this thing of like, oh, women in our family get married so young because we're so beautiful and like womanly and this. And like, I was raised to be a wife. Like, here's how mm -hmm. you serve tea. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. My entire life was like, how to- Were you ever connected to it? I don't think it was a, I think it was just like, I, 
it's just all I knew, you mm-hmm. know? And my mom was a housewife. She never worked. So, but I would also see she didn't make her own money. So she didn't really have like, she had like an allowance from my dad, you know? She wasn't like in her true power of it. And I saw very at a young age, I'm like, I never want to be that, you know? So for me, you know, I got married, someone I started dating when I was 24 years old and ended up not being a fit for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And now coming out of that marriage and who I've become in this past year, I'm like, wow, I'm so much more in touch with my true self without this like limitation that I had. Some parts actual like verbal limitation of, oh, you can't post stuff like that. Or a wife is not supposed to be like that and like actual things, but also subconscious things of like, oh, when you're married, you shouldn't be this way. So isn't isn't it really, what what you experienced was a restriction. Yes. And that's the thing about children is your parents will never really understand you because you're an evolution of all of their understanding up to this point. And you got it at the young age of four years old. Right. And your, your point is to discover and integrate that into what is, you know, like I, I grew up the same way. You know, I saw an exhausted mother, you know, a, six boys, you know, two of them, half brothers, four of them, my, my, me being one of the four, the youngest. And it was like, well, she never was the, the, the allowance thing, right? What you're really seeing is inherently a distortion of the value, right? Because you represent archetypally what a wife is, not what they are representing what it is. Then you'll actually come to terms with what it is. And it's the same thing with marriage. What is it? A contract you guys sign? Is it the mortgage you pay on the house or the bullshit ring that you get from Tiffany's? It's like, it's far more than that. These things are in representation of something far bigger that we actually meet. We meet there. I agree. And And it's all around the protection of family, Mm -hmm. right? And it's like, well, you want to hurt your kids. Do it because you had to. You know what they'll see? A completely masculinized mother and a really exhausted, beaten down by life dad. And that's the worst thing you could do for your children. So understand that, that if you're not really connected to these things, you're not doing anybody a favor. But I'm also here to tell you that if you don't make a decision at some point in your life, you'll experience something far worse than exhaustion. You'll experience the lack of fulfillment. And there's nothing worse on a vibrational level than not being connected to our spirit. So it's just, it's really about being like, hey, you know, was mom doing this because mom chose it? Was dad actually doing the thing because dad chose it? Or are these both people that were just given a dialogue and just ran with a dialogue, even if it's good, right? You know, you you tell somebody, here are good things for you to do. Go hit the gym. They start hitting the gym. Then they start identifying with the gym because of all the investment they make in it. Now they're like, I'm Mr. Gym Hitter. And then they do something else, which is they don't break free from the identification and go to connection. They keep identifying. So they just pull more and more self-worth from it until eventually now they're getting exhausted. They're getting burnt out. Well, because it was, and then the one day they miss a week of training. They, They themselves feel like they missed a week of them. So it's, it's all about being able to really understand what exactly are we doing when we do these things? Let's have an investigation of what, what are these principles that we are protecting? What are men? What are women? What is marriage? Why family? What is family? What does it represent? What are we here for? Those questions, you'll hear people ask themselves that maybe once when they're 50. They won't even have an opportunity to think it. And I feel that a lot of women bear the grunt of raising children. So women sit with this question a lot more, I think, than men do. Well, yeah, which is problematic because men won't have that conversation with them either. Right, and that's why a lot of women are like, wait, realistically, me being a mom, you know, if it's 50 to 70% divorce rate, huge chance I'm going to be a single mom, Mm -hmm. you know? A lot of fear. Right. And would I, would I want to do this as a single mom? And I think if, if you're a yes to that, then go for it. But if you're a no, then there's just a a chance that would happen on top of that. You know, we're we're no longer in the tribe where we're like raising our children together. And by the way, that's a beautiful thing you're mentioning there, which is, yeah, no, there's no question about it. Um, Kids are pulled out of their homes. Mothers are given less responsibility. So the housewife seems more like a wait when I need you at my women call and figure it the fuck out. You're on your own, right? So it's not actually salvation because it's actually void of community, right? There was sisterhood and there's brotherhood. Women were really focusing on the development of their own children because women that really care about their children don't just exploit them and send them to an educational system that makes them question their self-worth, coming out knowing jack shit, like as if fractions have helped you about life. And that's that's the problem. You know, there there is no full accountability of what it means to be a father and a mother there's so much good that comes from it. And I would hate for anybody to abandon that because of course you're going to see yourself. And if you think that you've grown up to this point, I, I even myself, I'm speaking just because I have 13 nieces and nephews. They're 
the best representation of how you can improve yourself. You'll see how quickly you'll give advice. You'll see how quickly you'll start swearing like a sailor, you know? You'll start seeing a lot of your behavior changing. And it's like, because you understand that maybe it's about protection of what is true. And the truest thing is the child. The child is the authentic part of us that doesn't make us artificial and will fight back for what we believe is right. So we preserve it, we protect it. Women educate, grow it, nurture it, and heal it. And, and men represent the accumulation of the values that were instilled by their mother. But most women in this society do not have the luxury of being supported by a devoted husband who is taking care of all of their needs so they can homeschool their children. Right. Well, I mean, that's the whole thing. It's like two people giving up on the ideal, two people giving up on the dream. And truth be told, not all women want that. I would not want that reality. You know, I, I do feel that a lot of women are reaching higher levels of self-actualization where, you know, I wouldn't be on this podcast if that was my reality. And I do feel deeply fulfilled from it. So maybe it is time to question those roles. Like I would be curious, are those maybe to you, they're the ideal, but maybe they're not the ideal to every person. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I don't think that there's anything romantic about a man going, hmm, fatherhood, protecting a woman, monogamy. But if we don't question those things and actually start going, well, if those things ring true, and I'm all the way out here. Maybe we can bring these both here so I can actually bring it into the world, opposed to just be the idealistic religious individual who everybody hates, who even pulls their power from the fact that they believe in God more than you do. So they're not actually righteous. They don't believe in God. They just attach their worth to their belief in God. So what you're really getting into is, is the struggle behind life. Like why, evolutionarily speaking, like if I, if I just completely made you reptile, you wouldn't even be having this conversation. You'd be finding a guy, you'd be reproducing. He'd be like, okay, this works. I protect you, want to protect my offspring, just doing it just because. So like what you're describing is inherently the advanced version of that. Just doing it just because my parents told me, this is what I think I believe. This is what I know to be true, but it's really the same thing. So it's like what you're pretty much bringing in here is the choice and with choice, there has to come connection and there's no choice unless there's full understanding of it. There's a lot of dark sides to fatherhood. There's a lot of dark sides to motherhood. There's a lot of dark sides to monogamy. There's a lot of dark sides to a healthy relationship. There's a lot of dark sides to me. There's a lot of dark sides to you. And if we can't bring both of those things out into the light so that we can make a decision, then is it really a choice? Or is it just something that we conveniently do because we just want to survive into the next day and experience a little more dopamine? I think that that is a frightening idea that People will actually won't look at the accumulation of these things, accept them and understand that it will come with responsibility. And the difference is faith. You know, like, why would this be different? He's, let's just say you meet a guy, top notch level dude. He says everything that you've done, he's discovered himself to the level that he has. Maybe he came out of a divorce himself. He's ready, he's ready to give this a go. It's gonna threaten a lot about who you are right now. And it's gonna threaten a lot about who he is right now. You know, there's a lot of power and significance pulled to men that could have multiple women. There's also a lot of significance that I get even from being single. And I've had to discover that because I feel what? I'm on my own, I'm free, I can do whatever. Th that'll be threatened when I get married. That'll be threatened when I have children. But I have to be able to see the negative associations behind it because the last thing I want to be is the clean shaven dude in his thirties with a Rolex driving a convertible. You wanna be able to move on past that. You know the biggest nightmares? is seeing the 45-year-old guy at the club. Also the biggest nightmare, the single mother who's also at the club. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that that's a utopia? It's not a utopia. No, it's and it's like, well, we understand what the utopia is. And it's like, what do you say to the guy at the club, brother? Everyone's miserable at the club, let's be real. Yeah, right? It's like, <laughs> get a wife, bro. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, well, in her case, it's shit, what happened? You know? <laughs> okay, here's the alternative. Let's let's reverse this. Not those those depictions, but like maybe someone just, loves music and this lifetime for them is not about being a parent. Look, I, I, all I'm just trying to say is that you put somebody in an environment, which is clearly like, whenever I hear somebody and I meet somebody and it was some dude, I was actually gonna buy a car off of him and I met him, good looking guy, successful dude. And I was like, oh, are you married, have any kids? He's like, fuck no, dude. And I was like, okay, how old are you? He's like, 38. Does that make you feel safe as a woman? No, of course. I, I heard some guy at the gym today, but he was, he told the other guy, they're both in their fifties, maybe sixties. He's like, bro, you're so lucky you're not married. I'm like, wow, is this how people talk? Right. And it's like, backs? that's not a good thing to say. It's, it's like, horrible. God, yeah. I, I can't imagine that being a healthy society. Not, I also don't burden people with these things. Help people. Like, what do you think with children are? Like, you just want them to be the best, right? You want them to be the best that they can be. You want them to make the right choices. Can you make them make the right choices? 
No, you can't unless you're an overbearing father, or overbearing mother, which means that you're going to fuck your child up. So ultimately, at the end of the day, doesn't it involve faith and just belief that this person will make the right choices for themselves? And, you know, like this is actually how we can start doing that. And it's like, by the, I love how we act like, you know, pregnancy just won't happen if people are having sex. So like we're either creating a reality or we're not protecting sex and actually ele elevating men and women to be meeting in the context of sex or you're constantly exploiting it. You know, you're inherently promoting people to not go on about what life is about. It is to provide, to protect, to love and to nurture and to reproduce. I mean, it, it is a pretty simple game, but we have to start understanding the complexity behind ourselves to understand that we will start playing the simple with our complexity. That'll make us fulfilled. So I'm curious your take on this. You know, I've been really sitting with this concept of marriage till death do us part. How can, how can we know? We, we change so much. Why is a successful relationship one that lasts for the rest of our lives? I, I see myself how much I, I've changed. In every seven years, you're entirely a new person. Every cell in your body changes. So maybe the new model of it is be together for as long as it feels mutually beneficial. I agree with you. You know, you got to do it once and you do it one day. You show up one day and you got the divorce papers on the left side of the bed and you can make love to each other on the right. This is a world where we have to evolve. We have to be better. We have to confront our insecurities because clearly the people that do these things are in very long lasting, healthy, loving relationships and they're still in love with each other. A level of presence is scary. Presence is scary because there's no security in presence, you know? And as men and as women, we typically would like to know that we can provide that kind you, we can provide that to you and that as men, we can feel it. Imagine that showing up every day with a person without placing an expectation on them. And you guys are both meeting towards those core values together, accumulatively, showing up every day like that's all you have. And what if till death do us part was I die at 12? How much can I give to this? Don't project yourself into the future, right? That statement itself is projecting yourself in the future. And you're like, what if you get fat? Projection in the future. What if I'm no longer attracted to you? Projection into the future. You're beautiful. And I'm extraordinarily attracted to you. That's what is. Show up to that every day and watch how your definition of beauty changes when you are fat and old. Not many people want to do that. Well, because it'd be so great. I know that I have the woman, all my self-worth, and remember oh, the list, the checklist of things that a now partner has to be. They met all of your needs that a village would meet, right? As, as you like to say. And then now you have to realize that that doesn't make you feel filled at all. But re really what I was initially saying prior to that is that you're going to have to show up every day to this, like as if the door is open. Or are you that secure? And of course, you know, there's going to be fights and, and you're going to come back to the words that you said to somebody and those things have value. And if marriage isn't a vow, that should be taken really fucking seriously, which I agree. But it's also something that needs to be shown up to every day if you want to keep it romantic. Because if somebody says marriage to a man, it feels sexless, right? You say it to a woman, it feels safe also feels sexless because that's the 21st century paradigm is if, if it's a committed and if it stands for something more and if it involves often something that allowed you to exist like children, I don't want it. It seems, so, so it seems, why do it we seems need void the paper? of adventure. We don't need the paper. I'm convinced we don't need the paper. You don't need the rabbi. You don't need the minister. It's a, it's a commitment that a man makes to a woman. It's between each other and it is sealed with two things, you having sex with each other and living with each other. If that isn't, and of course, children, because that'll be the difference between a serious relationship or a non-serious relationship. Because, you know, I, I can tell you a lot of women are married and it's like, well, you know, sure, I was married, you know, but you just had a document from the state that allows you to kind of, you know, not have to- Break up with a party. <laughs> yeah, 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 right? And it's like, you don't want there to be, there's of course a serious amount of investment that goes into it, just like a business would, you know? For sure. What I learned from having my divorce is that marriage is in no way security. It's in no way, oh, now that we're married, I'm going to show up as the husband that I always was going to be. People's shadows will show up regardless. Yeah, date each other. Try that. And right. keep dating each other. And if you want to call it marriage, if you want to call it soul union, whatever keeps you turned on, don't use the word. You know, you can't say the word God to a lot of people. It immediately shuts them down. And I'm not here to tell you that God is the only word to define it by the universe, the eternal spirit, the infinite intelligence, you know, whatever you want to do. But just like get together, understand that if you guys are really meeting each other eye to eye on every level, challenge each other first and see if that brings the best out in each other. And if that keeps doing that, well, I think you met your soulmate because every time you're like, sex is boring, not feeling connected and they don't go, what's wrong with me or vice versa. 
You could have somebody sit down and listen to you and you could create an intimate space by which you guys come together. Of course, there's going to be positive. You, you, that person's invaluable. There's, there's nothing you could do to replace that person because there's somebody that only wants your well-being. And you guys both also want the goal, the vision. You both want it so much. And when I'm done wanting you, or for maybe one day, it doesn't feel so great. I know that we both want this and that we will want each other. And that takes wisdom and understanding of what this is collectively. Because if I think, you know, I'll just leave this and find somebody else with a different name. That's very common for people. You find the same girl, different name, same guy, different name. So it's very important to understand that you got to recognize that too. And that if you do not confront the internal issues and you can do it with a woman and a woman will reflect everything on an internal level. So being with a woman is like an accelerated version to being single. And being with a man is like an accelerated version to being single too, because they'll bring out all the repressed parts in you. So opposed to me having to go, hmm, interesting emotion I felt when I was on this podcast. I can already understand a lot of the repressed emotions that I have just by looking at the woman in front of me and vice versa. It's how we're supposed to be. Like, it's just Absolutely. how we're supposed to be. I think relationship brings out all of your shadows and you can only really go so far in your healing when you're single because your blind spots are not illuminated. Isn't that crazy? In relationship. Oh my God, that's crazy. Yeah. That is so crazy. And we're designed to be relational beings, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. It's just... I think this institution of marriage with this contract to the government, it just doesn't, you know, and I, I, I believe a lot of us need to go through that to find the illusion and then realize that ultimately it's exactly that, that choosing of each other and, and creating a dharmic relationship. So like Dharma, Dharma is your soul's purpose. The big reason why you're here. So a Dharmic relationship is one where the relationship has a shared mission, a shared goal of, of, project, a creation, a family, something that you're here to bring together. And I believe that that's ultimately the, the Siddhi, the highest state of relationship of like coming together for something greater. So then when there are those sexless months and those hard conversations and the times that you do want to leave, which inevitably will show up, whether Absolutely. you have a marriage contract or not, it will, it's not always going to be fun and easy that there's something greater that's bringing you together. I think that all we've known in history is family, but it could be you're making a documentary together. It could be that you made a retreat center together. It could be that you're writing children's books or whatever the thing is. And I think if more relationships had that, they would work through a lot of the things that make it so easy to just walk away the moment it gets uncomfortable. You know, you, you mentioned something about it because, you know, there is, there is this, there's nothing secure about marriage and there's nothing secure about life. You're floating on a speck with infinity in each direction. Especially love and emotions. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's like, well, you're telling me what doesn't allow somebody's life to move forward is purely based off belief. It's based off faith. It's something that transcends the infinity in each direction. It makes infinity look small. It's something eternal. So you show up to a marriage, and I'll just say this for anybody, is that you, you need three things. You need confrontational ability. The ability to understand that everything is going to come around, you know, sitting down and confronting that person. Even if they leave the socks out and it pisses you off. If they did something in the bedroom that didn't feel like they met you, you communicate it. So it might feel like a lot of that. Rewarding spontaneity, the joy of life. Somebody wants to make love, do it there. Yes, and don't, don't bring a lot of no into it. You might not feel it, but don't undermine what will come in the future when you reward that he bought you maybe the flowers you didn't like. Don't go like, you didn't get me roses. Sure, he got you lilies, but he bought you flowers. Reward the fuck out of it. And then you could throw your preferences after when they see that this is the behavior you want. And then, of course, the last one is just presence, is that you're, you're going to have to show up with this. And you're, as difficult as that may be, there's going to be a lot of fear, but you're going to have to really believe in the person in front of you and trust them. And if you could trust them that you guys are accumulatively doing this together, then if we can at least have a good seven years together, that we gave it our all, then that's what's important. Come in with that mindset and you might find yourself falling in love. And then you guys both won't be asking any other question except how can I have you more in my life? And, and that's a romantic reality, but it's just one that takes a little bit more awareness. So let's say someone is listening to this and they they love how that sounds, but it just feels like their husband is just maybe not at a level of consciousness to fully understand that, mm -hmm. you know? And maybe there's just so much built up resentment that it feels like that just feels so far away. Oh, yeah. How can they start to bring more of this like coherence and heart connection that's the foundation of then having these really these difficult conversations yeah absolutely well 
for one, if you're feeling resentment towards somebody, imagine feeling frozen anger towards them every time that you see them until eventually they trigger you, piss you off, or you get drunk and then you express it. So that immediately needs to be confronted is that you have to make sure that all of these things and all of the dirty laundry is out of the table and that when you guys move on, you move on with even a fake smile for now. Because it's not an easy conversation to have where it's, I've been secretly hating you for seven years. And you're like, why? Because you never consider me. And he's like, well, how can I consider you if you don't speak up? But I feel when women speak up, the men often feel I'm being criticized. Well, that's the whole thing, that you can always set a frame when confronting people. Look, I'm going to sound like a harsh, mean, aggressive bitch. I really just want to know I'm out here in support of you. And I just want you to know this. I don't want to be in a position where I have to lie to you. Are you willing to let me tell you the truth? There isn't a human being on earth that goes, the truth, go fuck off, take your truth elsewhere. They'll go, please, I'm listening. This may sound harsh and critical. Because I don't know any other way to express it. See, that's called being vulnerable. You'll get vulnerability from the other person instantly. And now the other thing is, you know, you're probably listening to this and you're like, whoa, this sounds great. I could be having that. Don't undermine that you married that person. So there's going to be a few things you need to consider. What you were looking for prior when marrying that person. If you're going to leave them or if you're with them, understand what they've given you. Because if you can't recognize why you went into it, then you can't recognize what you were missing, that you wanted from this relationship, that you still weren't given. So it might not be their fault, might be yours. Then pay a little attention to if you guys are going to break up or whatever it is, or if you're going to move forward, notice how much they've, give, they've given you so that you can recognize that they've done more than enough. Because if you're going to demonize him and you think that that's going to be your way of moving on, well, good fucking luck. And then most importantly, you got to create the ideal. Whether you broke up with him or whether you guys are together, you're still going to have to do one thing. You're going to have to realize that you guys are really here together collectively to build this thing. Now, personality differences and a, and a whole list of priority differences can create a lot of struggle. But when you guys are really in it together, you guys are in it to win it. And you guys are both on the same boat here, which is, I don't want to have to compromise who I am, which is the most important one. You cannot compromise in a relationship. I know that it's like something that you guys want to do. But if you hit the point to where compromise is where you guys are going, well, the relationship is pretty much over because now you're going to have to cut off a part of yourself. And if you're okay to do that with a smile, go for it. But more than likely, you're not going to cut off your own hand so that they have a little more rest for their arm. I agree with you. And I've said that. And I've heard the feedback of like, well, marriage is compromise. And I always say, well, how can you create a win-win? Oh, well, you got to be a kick-ass negotiator who's willing to sit down and believe in the things that they say and also believe that the person in front of you wants the same thing, right? Right. You want to sleep well, but it's cold and you like it at 64 degrees. I like it at 75. Mm, that's going to be rough at first because bed, sleep, we both need sleep, right? Okay, we got it, right? So there's a lot of love already. I understand that you both need sleep, but every time it's at 75, you're sweating your ass off and I'm just fine, right? But every time it's at 64, I'm fucking shivering. So what most people do is they go, okay, babe. We'll do uh, 75 and now you're having miserable sleep. Now I wake up the next morning and I'm like, what's wrong? And you're like, nothing, didn't sleep well. Oh, right. And it's like, well, what you're supposed to be doing is really discovering how you can make that person smile as you do too. That's the act of love. And that's going to take challenging. But you, you look at most people's upbringings. Do you think they had an opportunity to go, hey, mom, dad, this is what I think. This is what I believe. Bring it out. No, they get shut down immediately. So it's something that you guys have to understand that it's not natural. It's something you need to go out of your way for. So then when you do it, you go, hey, well, how about this? We do 64 degrees. I'm happy. You're not. But we get you a heating blanket on the other side of it. So that means that you're going to be happy. I'm going to be happy. We're keeping it at 64. It's not halfway window open, window closed. Or 70 degrees, both miserable. It's going to be both of our needs met. Because the last thing we want is a contentious, agreeable, resentful partner in the morning. And we both want to make sure that if it's, if it's within our ability to work towards making each other come closer through a little negotiation, then let's do it. Because if you think that you got it right as a person, like, bro, we're so used to our preferences. Don't you want to expand? Well, you will never expand unless you're open. And that could be scary for a lot of men, you know, open. Well, what if I'm too open? Well, that's why you should probably pay attention to incorporate a little, bit, a little bit more presence. And you'll realize when you're being too open or too flexible. And then in these cases like this, it's going to be an amazing life. But of course, if it's chocolate and vanilla, she wants chocolate. And I don't really care for chocolate. It doesn't have anything to do with my values. Let's grab chocolate. You know, she wants the walls blue. And I literally couldn't give a shit. Let's give the walls blue. And it's like, you can really start realizing that actually then you guys are existing at 300%, not just even 200%, 300%. Because it's like a part of you that's like open to receive an additional 100 if you guys are both coming in as 100 and 100. 
Right. And then it's no longer a compromise because you're ultimately both getting love on the other end. Absolutely. And by the way, it's actually really fun too when you know that you're going to get down to the bottom of it. Imagine that every time you have a confrontation with your partner, it's gotten better. Do you think that you're going to have a negative association of confrontation or it's going to be something you call contribution that is collective? Mm-hmm. It's very romantic too. You guys are like, ooh, what do we have here today? Sorry, what did I do? Right? Exactly. And then it's no longer a personal attack on your worth or your value or you're not good enough. It's just a way that we can get closer together. And, and that's something that's important. Now, it might be how you raise the kids. Well, that's a conversation you should have had on the first date. You might have looked like a loony when you said it on the first date, but no, that's somebody who cares about themselves. Believe me, she'll see it. She'll respect it if you mean it. What do you mean, kids with you? I don't even know you. I don't care. It's just about you as a person. I want to understand how you feel about raising children. And, you know, you don't want a Buddhist household and a Jewish one. You know, you don't want a Catholic and a Hindu. You, you want to make sure that you guys are collectively going to raise the children the same way. And those kind of things cannot be compromised because those are the things that make you you. And if you're willing to kill you, what do you think you just told her that you're going to do to her later? Oof, that, that one hit. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this. It really left us so much to really like gnaw on. I feel like every single little piece you said, it's like, it could be a chapter of a book. So thank you for sharing that. that. Yeah. And I feel people will want to re-listen to this episode again and again and really get all the gems out of there. So I want to acknowledge you for your wisdom that you've just incarnated with at this young age and being able to like have these awarenesses. It's so beautiful and it gives me hope and men and the rising of the masculine and shows us, you know, we kind of have this idea that like, oh, well, like, only until a man's like 43 does he reach emotional maturity. That's and then, heartbreaking, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So I love I love seeing that being inherent in you because it gives us evidence that it's possible. So thank you for existing. Well, thank this. you so much for having me and for being so precise. Oh, thank and, you. and also connecting to what you believe. That's great. That's yeah. really, it's fresh. Not a lot of people connect to the things that they say. They just, they're like, this is a good buzzword for Instagram. It's like, no, I felt that immediately. Every time you spoke, it almost, it took me a step back. It's very powerful. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you gained so much from it. Please share it on your Instagram stories, tag us. This is a really powerful way of having these deep, vulnerable conversations with your friends, getting to know each other. So if you guys, I feel like a lot of times us girls, we go to our friends for support and it can actually like really mess with our heads sometimes when our friend gives us a piece of advice, maybe just it's coming out of the goodness of their heart, but it's something that they've read. So I feel this is a really good episode for like maybe your friend group to listen to. So you can all kind of like have this conversation and say, yeah, these are the things that I want. And then be able to give each other advice from that place, because I know how deeply that affects us. And if you love this episode, please, leave a review for it in the iTunes store and I will send you my free womb meditation, which is a meditation that allows you to connect to your divine feminine sacred center, your womb place, which is your house of intuition, creativity, sensuality, and so much more. So all you got to do is leave a review on the iTunes store, take a screenshot and email it over to me at sahara at iamsaharose.com. You can find that email and all of the links mentioned in the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one. Trust your intuition, trust your inner wisdom, trust your inner guidance.